Welcome to Lectures by Lobizi. I'm your host, Dr. Lobizi. Uh, in today's video, we're going to be talking about the economic system known as capitalism. In later videos, uh, we'll talk about socialism and communism and then kind of compare them. Um, so today I want to talk about many of the elements of capitalism but before we start with that really kind of got to go through uh, a history of capitalism before we dive into that however i want to talk about just i think when people talk about capitalism they just sort of make this assumption um, that the united states is a capitalistic country and that's not altogether incorrect um, however it's not altogether accurate as well so what do i mean well, um, one of the hallmarks of capitalism is sort of um, economic freedom. And uh, I wanted to just kind of show that the United States is something, I mean, it definitely has capitalistic elements, um, but um, for our purposes, it's really a mixed economic system. Um, so what that means is it's sort of a combination between capitalism and socialism. However, um, it's more capitalistic uh, than socialistic. So what does that mean? Well, it's kind of like a sliding scale. Um, and then the term economic freedom can kind of be used to gauge, like, so how capitalistic are we versus how socialistic uh, are we? So if we take a look at around 2007 so this is from the heritage foundation website and what it says here is in 2006 2007 right before the great uh, recession of 2008 the united states had an economic freedom score of 81.2 and if you look that means it was considered free so that would be much more capitalistic than socialistic um, but if you were to fast forward to today, uh, the score is much lower. It's 72.1. Okay. So that means we're mostly free. So we're still, you know, on the, uh, economic, uh, on the capitalistic side. Um, but let's just kind of, to get, I don't know, some context, it might be important to compare, uh, the United States versus other countries. So who does, um, this website, the Heritage Foundation, who do they sort of rank as the most free? Uh, and you can see that's Singapore. Um, and in fact, what's surprising is the United States isn't even in the top 10. Um, so Singapore, Switzerland, Ireland, those are the three most free. If you were to look down here, um, the United States ranks uh, 25th, uh, right behind uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, if we were to continue on our list and go all the way towards the bottom, um, the last three uh, countries uh, based on economic freedom would be Cuba, Venezuela, and North Korea. And the way in which they describe them, economically speaking, is uh, as repressed. Um, so what does that mean? That means that those countries are much more socialistic, okay? What about China? We often talk about China uh, and they're ranked really low too at 158th. Um, you might be surprised because you might be confused thinking, well, I always heard that uh, Cuba, North Korea, and China are communist. Um, so wouldn't that be more accurate to say that they're communist? Actually, no. From an economic standpoint, uh, they aren't. They aren't communist. That's going to be a little confusing. I'll just say this, um, communism has never existed as an economic system within a country. Well, not in the modern age, okay? Um, it certainly hasn't. Um, you'd have to go to like, I don't know, the Amazon, uh, Amazonian rainforest where there might be a tribe, like a lost tribe where they might operate under communism where everything is shared. But in the modern age, certainly no country uh, has had a communist economy anyway that might confuse you a little bit and i apologize but i just wanted to give a little context so let's kind of begin with um where did co uh, capitalism come from um uh, well before there was capitalism there was something i don't know we could call it like proto-capitalism it was 
something known as laissez-faire economics. And so where does that come from? Well, during the Enlightenment, a uh, period where I have looks like circa, so that means roughly 1685 to about 1800, there was a group of uh, French economists called physiocrats that argued uh, that there were uh, natural laws that governed the economy and um, government's uh, attempts to interfere or regulate the economy are were um, dangerous uh, to the like sort of economic health of a particular country and so they felt uh, that the best thing to do for governments was to do very little okay and so we'll kind of get into that um, so what I have here is a couple of graphics um, they believed that natural laws uh, governed um, the uh, economy, just like uh, they believed that natural laws governed the universe. So like Isaac Newton's um, law of gra um, universal gravitation, okay? And when we say the word law, that's not to be confused with man's laws, you know, where governments come up with um, legal systems uh, or things like that. This is something that, try as we might, as humans, we can't interfere. Okay, so natural laws are something that um, prior to discovery sort of uh, lay hidden, okay? And so that's what they believe. They believe that there are certain laws that govern the economy, okay? And for it to operate, function the best sort of at its um, most efficient it, it should be unfettered by any types of uh, regulations or laws uh, from the government okay uh, these physiocrats uh, were critical of the economic system known as mercantilism and that's sort of in at least in Europe anyway um, the economic system of the day. Uh, what is that? Well, roughly it just means um, that countries in competition with one another felt that the government needed to sort of uh, be a cheerleader for their country's economies. And so they interfered quite a bit. Um, they tried to uh, ensure that their country would become wealthy, oftentimes at the expense of others so there was a lot of um global competition and a lot of that had to do with trade and natural resources and colonies and things like that and so governments it was common practice uh, at the time of the enlightenment it was common practice for countries governments to be heavily involved okay so one of the things uh that these physiocrats were against is something called tariffs okay and you can see by the graphic here that tariffs are a taxes placed on imports okay countries often used tariffs sort of as a revenue source for the government to function um, but there was a more important uh, reason why tariffs were placed on imports and that was to protect protect domestic producers okay so if you again if you look at this graphic here um the example they're using uh, are socks okay so let's say um, the United States and uh, the United Kingdom or Great Britain produced socks okay uh, and each pair cost three dollars and if the um, United States wanted to encourage American consumers uh, to buy uh, American made socks well, they could place a tariff and here. It looks like there is a tariff of one dollar placed on a pair of socks. And so the, the logic there is that Americans would um, therefore be encouraged to purchase socks that were made in the United States. Why? Because they're cheaper. OK, uh, this was common practice, but um, it was these physiocrats who said, no, that's not good. Um, it's best that there is free trade because some countries are just more um, apt to produce certain goods more cheaply okay so like for example um 
I don't know, the British, they were really good at making textiles, like clothing, okay? So they might be able to produce clothing um, that's much cheaper than other countries can. Um, let's take another country like Italy, um, or the at least the Italian peninsula at that time. They made a lot of wine. Uh, that was something that they just naturally excelled at. Um, consumers around the world uh, would benefit from free trade because they would get access uh, to the best clothing, you know, coming from Great Britain or the, bre uh, the best wine coming from Italy. Okay. And so they saw uh, tariffs as an um, unnecessary interference with um, the economy. Okay. And because of this, um, another French or a French term was used to sort of, um, name this kind of uh, economic uh, thought, and that was known as laissez-faire. So the term laissez-faire economics is used to just describe uh, any kind of economic system where the government plays a uh, little, little role, okay? Well, are there any instances where the government should uh, play a role? The laissez-faire econ economists or the physiocrats would say yes, okay? Um, to sort of enforce certain laws, okay, regarding maybe private property or like business contracts. So I don't know if two people entered a uh, business contract and one sort of reneged on their responsibility, um, it would be fine as far as the physiocrats were uh, concerned for, what you know, the other business partner, uh, partner to sue, okay, because of like a breach of contract or something like that. And then the other, and this is probably more important, and that is to guard against monopolies, okay? A monopoly is when all the competition has been um, sort of run out. Um, they've been driven out of business. And so in a particular industry, there's only one. Um, and so they say that that is, that's bad. Uh, when there is no competition. Okay, so that could be another role for the government to play. Um, and that leads us then to Adam Smith. And who is Adam Smith? He was a uh, Scottish um, economist, okay? And he embraced uh, the teachings of laissez-faire and he developed them further. Okay, and so for that reason, he's sort of known as the father of capitalism, okay? And uh, he had a best-selling book uh, known as The Wealth of Nations. He goes down in history as sort of either the first or the second most important um, economist of all time. So he is something, uh, he is someone you should be familiar with. Uh, the other person, uh, the other economist who's famous and significant, like Adam Smith, would be Karl uh, Marx. And we'll discuss him in a later video. Um, so just like the physiocrats, uh, Adam Smith was critical of mercantilism. There was another practice that mercantilist uh, countries also engaged in, and that is the use of subsidies, okay? And a subsidy is money that the government grants uh, usually to a company. And um, it, th this is, the subsidy is designed to give them economic support so that they can do something. And so most traditionally, uh, governments used subsidies when it came to uh, like companies that would manufacture uh, large ships, uh, sailing vessels, uh, to help encourage or you know otherwise foster overseas trade. So they oftentimes gave um, money, you know, and it could be tax breaks or it could be grants um, to help these companies kind of get off the ground. All right. And uh, Adam Smith saw this as a bad idea, again, uh, because it interfered with natural competition. OK. And so he was he was against that, as are uh, all laissez faire economists. OK. Um, okay, so according to Adam Smith, there were three specific natural laws of uh, economics. And the first is self-interest. 
the law of self-interest. So what is the law of self-interest? That just means that, you know, from a biological standpoint, people tend to do what's in their best interest. Meaning, you know, starting at a young age, we, we, we tend to avoid danger, um, things that are going to put our lives at risk, we, we tend to avoid. Um, but sort of on the other end of the spectrum, people tend to gravitate towards things that will reward them. And he found that um, money is a great motivator, probably the greatest. And that may turn people off because that sounds selfish or greedy, but it's true. Um, money tends to motivate people. Uh, that's why people o o open businesses. Um, they're motivated by the profit motive. Um, and consumers are as well. We as consumers uh, operate uh, by the same principle of self-interest. We don't want to spend any more than we have to when it comes to buying goods. We often, you know, look for the best deal uh, so that we can keep some of our hard-earned uh, money in our pockets. Uh, the second law would be the law of competition. And I kind of referenced that uh, before. The law of competition is what keeps um, businesses honest. Meaning, you know, if they don't keep their prices uh, low uh, and the quality of their product or service high, then consumers are going to go elsewhere. They're going to find uh, another business to give their money to. And so... The idea of competition is that really benefits uh, the consumer, us, the people who have money to spend. So without competition, prices tend to go up and quality uh, tends to go down. And then the third law would be the law of supply and demand. Um, and what that means simply is if there is a particular relationship between supply and demand and relation um, and price. So the relationship between demand and price is sort of consistent, meaning if demand is high, prices tend to be high and the reverse. If demand is low, um, price tends to be low. OK, um, but working against that or sort of contrary to that is supply. So if supply is uh, typically high, then the price tends to be low and vice versa. Okay. So these, again, are natural laws, not man's laws or human's laws. They are, they, they are what they are. Okay. And um, people or uh, the government can't really manipulate those. They can try, but um, they're not going to be too successful. All right. And so here in the notes, it just talks about how when Great Britain went through its agricultural revolution and then later its industrial revolution, there was an increase in uh, population. So that meant that there was an increased demand for um, consumer items. OK, and that had an impact on uh, prices. OK. The next topic I want to discuss, and this is probably the most complicated of uh, Adam Smith's, and that is the idea or the concept of the invisible hand. Um, <clears throat> it is this metaphor, the invisible hand, that is why Adam Smith is considered an Enlightenment figure. When we talk about the Enlightenment, um, this is a period w that focused on human progress. This idea that um, there was a desire to improve the quality of life, um, in, in increase human happiness, and reduce human suffering. And Adam Smith is considered an Enlightenment figure. So it's because of the invisible hand that that is the case. Okay. So according to Adam Smith, the marketplace is where, and, and it's more of a um, hypothetical um it, it it's not necessarily it's more of an abstract concept the marketplace and oftentimes i say to my students it's kind of like amazon it's a place where uh, producers and consumers meet uh to negotiate to negotiate and kind of hash out um whether or not 
a deal is going to be made, meaning a sale. So whatever the product might be or the service, um, consumers make a decision as to whether or not they want to buy a particular product. If the product is good and the price is reasonable, there's a good chance that that um, purchase is going to be made. Um, both parties, the consumer and the producer, stand to benefit from that transaction. The producer makes money, and at least theoretically, the consumer gets the product. And so perhaps uh, they are somehow satisfied. Maybe uh, they're happier because they've made this purchase. Or it, it's a type of medicine that is needed, and so it's going to in some way um, measurably uh, improve their health. That idea is what Adam Smith means when he talks about um, social harmony, that when these transactions and millions of them are made every day, when we kind of sort of track these transactions, what we see over time especially is that social harmony tends to go up, meaning human progress. And what is that? That's increasing human happiness and the decreasing of human misery. And so capitalism or the free marketplace is responsible for the elevation of society over many, many years. Okay. And so um, that's not without controversy. And when we discuss um, socialism and uh, especially communism, we'll, 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 we'll talk about uh, some of the critiques or criticisms of capitalism. Uh, I want to round out our discussion uh, today with two other uh, capitalistic or laissez-faire um, thinkers, and their names are Thomas Malthus and David Ricardo. Um, they are less significant than Adam Smith, um, in part because the ideas or theories that they had about like laws of nature proved incorrect and um, they kind of give um, capitalism a bad name all right so we're going to explore that over the next couple minutes and then that will um, do it for today so <clears throat> capitalism first uh, provide a definition is an economic system in which the the factors of production are privately owned uh, and money is invested in business ventures to make a profit. OK, so capitalism and economic freedom, that's kind of what that means. Uh, people are free uh, to own property and free to make the decisions about what they want to do with their property um, without the interference of government or other entities. So. First, let's talk about Thomas Malthus. He was concerned that the population of uh, England had uh, begun to rise uh, substantially. Okay, and a lot of that had to do with uh, increased food supply um, due to the agricultural revolution and then the elimination of uh, smallpox uh, at the end of uh, the uh, 1700s. Um, and so he was concerned that the population was going to outstrip the food supply. And uh, that is sort of known as today a Malthusian crisis. All right. There would be a crisis that would take place when population outstripped the food supply. Um, obviously, you know, you would have to deal with uh, starvation, famine, um, death, and then more chaos. Uh, likely war and none of that is good and so his concern was um, that governmental intervention um, would be bad and up until this point anytime there was famine uh, the government was expected to step in and provide relief uh, regardless of the country um, he said that that was bad because that would only sort of uh, prolong the inevitable and maybe make things worse. Um, 
And so he kind of had a survival of the fittest type mentality in that, you know, people need to um, work hard and uh, struggle. And if they do, then they'll survive. Um, but even with that, I mean, there still is a shortage of food and really, you know, some would would not get enough food or whatever and they would they would suffer and die. Um, so he was against any kind of uh, governmental support. He kind of softened. There was some pushback against his, um, you know, his his sort of remedy for this. And then he said, well, later on after criticism, he said, well, perhaps people could just do this on their own um, by choosing to have smaller families. And then that would put less pressure on the food supply. Um, so we'll talk about um, kind of how that all uh, fleshed out in just a moment. But uh, first, let's talk about David Ricardo and then his theory. So he proposed something. So he was a, a contemporary of uh, Malthus, um, but he came up with something known as the Iron Law of Wages. So I quickly want to go through that with you. And, and it is, it, it does follow logical uh, or logic. It makes logical sense. Um, but I think uh, the premise um, of his argument is faulty. Uh, but let me take you through it first, and then I'll explain why I think it's faulty. Um, so he's sort of using the laws of supply and demand, and he's applying it to wages, which is fine. You can do that. Um, but so he says that uh, if there is a situation where wages were high for workers, that they would, uh, instead of uh, using those increased wages uh, to purchase consumer goods, they would have more children um, and then use those resources, uh, you know, to to be able to, cl uh, you know, clothe and feed their kids. He said long term that was a problem because that was going to create a greater um, uh, labor supply. And as the labor supply goes up, that's going to work against wages um, because of their um, opposite sort of relationship. Um, and so that would cause wages to go down. And then once wages were low, um, the populate people would stop reproducing as much, and then the population would decrease. And then the process would start again because uh, low, uh, fewer workers would cause wages to go back up. And then once they were back up, uh, people would respond by having more kids. And so that was sort of his prediction. Um, suffice it to say that he was incorrect as well. So both Malthus and uh, Ricardo were incorrect. Uh, the food supply continued to grow, and this, uh, David Ricardo's theory, uh, never really worked out uh, either. Um, he had a very similar uh, take as far as how to deal with this, that you shouldn't provide any kind of economic aid uh, to the needy, Okay. Uh, because of the, 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 them, especially Ricardo Malthus and Ricardo, um, economics is nicknamed the uh, the dismal science. Um, but yeah, as I said, um, you know the, the, their theories uh, have been proven incorrect, and that may uh, be some of the reason why, at least for some people. They have a uh, negative uh, opinion of capitalism. Um, but yeah, tune in to the next uh, video because I'll be discussing socialism. And then the third in the series, we'll discuss uh, communism. And then I'll kind of share uh, my thoughts on uh, sort of which is uh, best and the best uh, moving forward. All right. Thanks for watching.